Hey, 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 good people. So this week we're continuing with our primary topic, which is social institutions and social issues. And this week we're going to be focusing on um, articles, discussions, videos relating to education and health. Now, I will tell you this at the beginning, there are several supplemental videos that I'm going to encourage you to uh, please watch uh, and use the information from those videos uh, to assist you on your discussion board post. There are some videos in regards to education, how school district, how school districting, districting, sorry, I'll get it out, how that impacts um, student outcome uh, based on socioeconomic status. And also one really interesting TED Talk or TEDx um, video that I have in there in regards to the, the focus or some of the things that a public school system may do um, that creates or can or causes a continuation of some of their students remaining in low income uh, and in a low income status. Uh, so, and there's also a video um, where we're talking about health, um, and it's one that if I had you for intro to social, I may have given you a peek into it. But this one is about. Um, over medicating foster care children uh, and kind of what that looks like, how we, uh, we meaning society as a whole, first of all, how we label and identify how we categorize students that may have or children that may um, be in need of or be placed in foster care system, how they're initially categorized, and then our responses to some of the issues or some of the problems, behavioral problems that they may be experiencing not behavioral problems just because I want to misbehave, but we have to remember the population that we're speaking about. We're speaking about children who have been uprooted from their foundation, from what is um, comfortable for them, what they are knowledgeable about, what they know about, and placed into situations where this is all brand new. So we want to be mindful of that when we're watching this video. So those videos are going to be in the module this week. But let me move on and I'm going to tell you about the articles that we're going to be reading this week. So the first one is entitled From the Achievement Gap from the Achievement Gap to the Education Debt. Arr! Understanding achievement in US schools and what does that mean? This author Gloria Latson Billings, she does an exploration of the achievement gap. And this may be something that you are familiar with that you may have heard about um, in little bits and pieces. And Gloria, this author is giving just a brief review of some possible causes of achievement gaps. And now of course she's looking at this based on race and socioeconomic status. So she's comparing the success of white students to minority students to students who may be in lower socioeconomic status. So, but with that, again, she just briefly is reviewing some of the, the possible causes. One of the main things that she's looking at is the connection between the educational debt and the country's financial debt. So this is a really, really interesting article, guys. So uh, again, take your time, take the opportunity to not just read this article, but watch the videos, the supplemental videos that I have in the module, because they will add some additional content to what this author is exploring. Okay, so the second article that we're going to be reading is, it is entitled, and this one has several contributing authors to it. This article is entitled, Academic Resilience Among Undocumented Latino Students. Now, this is a really, really interesting article, especially when, if you're doing some independent research, or if you have any background uh, knowledge on the DACA students and the issues that our, our government is currently addressing uh, in regards to DACA students. So, so when we're thinking uh, about uh, the achievement gaps or the academic resilience of these students, one of the things that the contributing authors do is that they are doing a study with uh, about 110 students across the United States. Um, and they're looking at these students coming from high school, community college, and four-year institutions, four-year colleges and universities. And some of the things that they're looking at include the psychosocial risk factors as well as the protective factors. And when they de describe them in the article, they refer to them as uh, high level risk factors or low level risk factors. And I just kind of flip it around, look at the low level risk factors as protective factors. Um, so one of the things that they talk about or that these authors talk about in this research is that uh, the students that they've been studying, those students who have a 
a high protective factor or a low risk factor. These students that have the low risk factors, as well as those that have the high uh, risk factors, uh, these students kind of have the same type of outcome because you're looking at the high risk factors in conjunction with what the student's personal investment is, as well as the environmental resources. And it is very important that we understand environmental resources. And I'm sure you all have probably, um, throughout your educational journey, have been hit with a combination of some of these environmental resources along the way from some uh, instructors, from teachers, from counselors, just encouraging you to invest in your community, which shows to be an investment in yourself. So these environmental uh, factors and resources that we look at is volunteerism within your community. We're looking at parental involvement in the community, looking at the importance of supervision or supportive adults in the community. So when we're thinking about these students and the resources, first of all, that they find for themselves, you know, tapping into that want to, along with the resources that are available to them within the community, it's showing that even though some of these students are faced with some, some big obstacles, some struggles, their academic achievement, their resilience is still one that kind of measures up to those students or is equal to those students who may not have similar struggles or obstacles in their way. Okay, so our third article that we're going to be reading. This article is written by David Connor, and the article's title, I'm just going to give you the the. Uh, first part of the article's title because it is very long. It is Michael's story. I get into so much trouble just by walking. So this article is very interesting and it is taking a personal look into the life of a young man and his journey, some of the obstacles that he faces based on this intersectionality of who he is. And uh, some of the labels that are used to define him. This is a young black man um, who is in the working class and he has a mental health problem. He's diagnosed with dyslexia. So this young man is, he is faced with several different labels that he has to learn how to navigate in his daily interaction. So this author takes the opportunity to examine some of the structural powers at play that impact how Michael, um, how he how he identifies himself or how he is able to um move beyond uh the the uh oh gosh move beyond the 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 cell I'm losing my words y'all move beyond the what am I trying to say the boxes thank you that he has been set in so the first domain of power that the author looks at is a structural what structural realm so with the structural realm we're going to think about this again from a broad perspective, broad perspective, some of the institutions, agencies, organizations, things that factored into um, how Michael, um, his, his daily living. So the author looks at housing, education and employment. So those are three big things that we got to think about. The second realm that the author looks at is the disciplinary realm. So when we talk about education, since Michael was diagnosed with dyslexia, he automatically kind of fell into the criteria of being a student with uh, learning disabilities. So they may have labeled him and being in special education classrooms. What did that mean for him? The symbolic interaction. What did that mean for how he may have seen himself? <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. The third one, um, I'm sorry, let me, let me just go on with the disciplinary realm. Also, some of the things that it talks about, that the author talks about is the criminal justice system, as well as uh, labor management. Um, with him having that label and uh, of being dys dys dyslexic, I'm going to get it out, y'all. There's a battle, there's a struggle that he had um, and that he has even when seeking employment. The third realm that the author talks about is a hegem that hegemonic uh, domain. And if you remember, we talked about the hegemonic domain a couple of weeks ago, that male dominant domain, the dominance of what it looks like for your typically developed male in being successful. How does Michael measure up to that? And how does it make sense to him? The fourth realm that it talks about is that interpersonal domain. 
That's that symbolic interaction. All of the things that Michael's dealing with, all the labels that have been assigned to him, how is he making sense of the way that he needs to interact in society in order to be successful? So we're looking at the interconnectedness of these four different domains of power and how Michael is making sense of the way he needs to navigate within these, uh, the, these different domains of power. Okay, so the fourth article that we're reading this week, the final article, is entitled Health Inequities, Social Determinants and Intersectionality. So this article is all about um, looking at um, how we identify the intersectionality issues in healthcare in order to create a transformational type of paradigm that would be inclusive for everyone who is seeking health care. So one of the things this author talks about is trying to get us uh, in a position that we begin to view things from our intersectional lens. Um, so, you know, like we, we always talk about viewing things from a cultural lens, from a sociological lens. So this author is saying, I need you to think about the different labels that one may be assigned to, or they may, or the categories that they may fall within. And I want you to think about the interconnectedness of the intersectionality and how does this impact healthcare? So we can think about a couple of specific issues. Now, again, earlier in the semester, we talked about um, when we looked at sexuality, we talked about moving from transgender to trans and that author specifically looking at identifying health care for the trans community. Now we see that, or this author talks a little bit about that as well, about some of the discrimination that folks may face based on gender, race, and sexuality. So all of that, again, that interconnectedness of those, that all ties in together. All right, good people. So those are the articles that we're reading this week. Again, there are some supplemental videos that I encourage you to watch. It'll give you, again, some uh, additional background, additional foundation to information that is discussed in these articles. All right, y'all. So after you read the articles, think about what you're thinking about. Think about what you want to write about in your discussion posts um, and as well as for your weekly journal assignment. So y'all know how we end this. Either if you have any com comments or questions or concerns, hit me up on the phone or um, send me an email. And until I see you on a discussion post, peace out.